This is Open Door with Vince Robinson. In-depth conversations with people who are making a difference in the lives of others here and around the world. Culture is at the heart of who you are. Know your culture, find yourself on Open Door with Vince Robinson. Grand Dawning, Cleveland, Ohio, and the rest of the planet. Welcome to another edition of Open Door with Vince Robinson. My guest is an artist that I've been acquainted with for a number of years. I can tell you that he's a very active participant in art in Cleveland, Ohio. He is an HBCU educated visual artist specializing in conceptual art and graphic communication. He works with found objects, wood, panels, sculpture, and painting that allow for a variety of artistic expression and production. His professional and personal journey has also included a variety of uh, expression and production as he's navigated the artist community and network. He would describe his creative path as a multicultural patchwork because his chosen profession requires ongoing engagement with the outside world and its peoples. The freedom of communication that art allows helps him to create and witness the various aspects of human expression. He also sees art as a more therapeutic and healing activity that benefits his development as a human being. As a multidisciplinary artist, his process is information as he researches on his subject. Then he uses the information to build a spiritual framework in which to tell a story, which includes representations, symbolism, and tributes to his creative ancestors. He calls it cosmic folk art because of the natural way it develops his connection to the answers. Welcome to Open Door with Vince Robinson, Mr. Chester Hopkins Bay. Chester, how are you today? I'm doing fine. Good, sir. And yourself? I'm doing great, and I'm glad to finally have this conversation with you. Uh, So uh, what we do on this show is, is we give folks an opportunity to express whatever they'd like to about their personal history. Uh, Many of the people who I interview on this program are from Cleveland, but I'm not going to make that assumption about you. So I'll first ask, are you a native Clevelander? And if so, if you want to just describe your relationship to the city of Cleveland. I'm definitely a native Clevelander, born and raised uh, for a city hospital over in the Greenville neighborhood. Um, my connection with the city of Cleveland, I don't know. I mean, it's it, it's really all I know. So I don't know how to describe it. I mean, because it comes out in various forms. Mm-hmm. You know, okay. Cleveland's a very diverse city. So Okay. So as you were growing up, or were you one of those folks that was pretty much in the same area, or did you move around in different places? Um, I was pretty stable. You know, born in Glenville, but, you know, eventually we we located the Cleveland Heights, and that's pretty much where I spent most of my life. Okay. But, you know, I got around the city. Okay. So when did your connection with art begin? From birth. You know, I remember being in uh, kindergarten and drawing and... uh, writing poetry and things of that nature. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's pretty much been with me my whole life. I guess, you know, my mother says I get it from my father. So, cause he was an artist as well. Yes. If you could describe his trajectory as an artist. My father's. Mm-hmm. His trajectory was short lived because he, um, uh, I guess he had to take care of his family. I guess he looked at the other aspects because, you know, when I was growing up, I didn't see him doing a lot of art. So there were just pictures around that he had did when he was younger. He was in the May show and things like that. But he's always been a working man. So, you know, I've never seen him, him doing work, but I've seen his work. Okay. And so he's kind of left a lasting impression on you and you're carrying the ball forward, perhaps accomplishing some of the things that maybe he didn't accomplish as an artist. Yeah, I think that's it. I guess maybe art wasn't that uh, practical when you got a family to raise back then. Right. So, yeah, I guess I, I'm picking it up and I'm kind of 
pushing through to, you know, based on where the art is now. So, okay. So when was it that it hit you that I'm an artist, I have something to say, and I'm going to do whatever I have to do to make sure the world sees what I'm creating? Mm, I would say 1996. That was after I graduated from college. And I don't know, I guess I had a decision made because, I mean, back in 96, I guess the art landscape wasn't what it is now, where you see a lot of more opportunity now. So back then, you kind of, you know, being an artist, you just kind of had to be confident in that and stand on it, you know, because there wasn't a lot of um, means to make a lot of money off of it back then, or at least where I could see. Mm. Perhaps that was uh, one of the dilemmas that your father faced in addition to having to put food on the table and clothes on your back. There may not have been the receptivity to him functioning as an artist back then versus now. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I would uh, agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you are a multidisciplinary artist. Can you talk about the various lanes that you travel in as an artist? Well, I've always been a guy who drew. So drawing and painting, that always came natural. Uh, I do some spoken word. I uh, got into installation art. Uh, as of 2009. And I think installation art kind of helped me uh, submit my, my, my view on art because it allowed me to use pretty much anything to do art, whether it be sound, whether it be light, whether it be found objects, whether it be uh, objects constructed specifically for a, a particular uh, piece. So I would say uh, I'm part of a group called The Visit it stands for Visionary Installers Sharing Inspired Thoughts. And we kind of started off during the uh, 2009 Ingenuity um, as a show that just kind of evolved and became an arts collective. So, yeah, I would say, you know, installation art kind of allows me to touch all aspects of, of what I do. Mm-hmm. For the benefit of the listeners who may not be acquainted with installation art, could you describe what it is? Well, installation art is art that is done in a space. It can be sculptural. Uh, It can incorporate sound where you engage with the people who come into the space. It's kind of basically like a... There was a program in Cleveland, uh, Rooms to Let, and that's where, you know, the artists basically take uh, a whole house and transform the whole house into a work of art. So when you're walking through the house and you step through each room, each room could be a different experience. So I would say, you know, installation is more art that you have to experience if you want to get the full advantage of it. And you just can't, you know, see it in the book. You can see it in the book, but you definitely won't get the full scope of what's going on. So, yeah, I would say it's something that you really have to experience because there's so many levels to it. Mm. Are there any installations that you can think about right now to reflect upon and and maybe share with us some of the uh, groups or or organizations or nonprofits that you may have been connected to to facilitate those? Well, definitely uh, Ingenuity and Rooms to Let. They kind of give you the biggest outlet because... As an artist, you know, when you're doing painting and it's come time to hang the show, you know, a lot of people don't want holes in the wall because, you know, they're going to be changing out and your art is only in there for a certain amount of time. Um, with the installation piece, it's up for a certain amount of time, but depending on where it is, you can really come in and flex and, like, knock out a wall or, or erect something. So... Ingenuity and Room Select kind of gave us the biggest outlet for that because the way they were set up, it was for you to go in there and do that. Like the, the houses are demo not too long afterwards. So the art isn't standing anymore. But because it was in the house that was going to be demo, it allowed you to get really, really creative. You know, you can basically whatever you can imagine. That's what you can do. 
And although it's not, it was temporary and the houses aren't standing anymore, what it did do is allow you to open up and kind of push yourself as an artist. So just for the experience, you know, there was a lot to be gained in you doing something and, and, and how you create something. And so that kind of helps push you a little bit more than just, you know, putting yourself within, within a box and, and, and have yourself be limited to uh, just hanging in the, in the art show or a gallery. Okay. You mentioned the visit and um, I know that you have been doing uh, some collaborations or some work with uh, one of our most prominent artists in the city of Cleveland who actually has his own museum. And that's uh, Mr. Edward E. Parker. Uh, You want to tell us about your relationship with Mr. Parker and and some of what you've been able to accomplish with him. Uh, Mr. Parker, I met him. Right around that 95, 96, I think he was one who, uh, meeting him, helped me really get on the path to being an artist because uh, graduating from school, they teach you how to do art, but they don't necessarily teach you how to be an artist. And, you know, that comes along with being in the real world. And Mr. Parker is, um, when I met him, you know, I met him through a family member. And, you know, we have a lot of commonalities. We both are graduates of Central State University. Um, we both Aquarians, you know, if you're into the Zodiac thing. And it was just, he became one of my mentors. You know, he showed me the possibilities of what you could do because what he's done in East Cleveland, you know, I don't, I don't know if I've seen really any artists up here do it. You know, being an African-American artist, I don't think I've seen many artists do what he's done, you know, black or white. And he basically took a block in East Cleveland and converted that to his own gallery and his own studio. And he has a bed and breakfast and he's renting loft space. Uh, He has an event center. He has pretty much a whole self-contained environment uh, to be an artist, you know, and that's something that I kind of aspire to. Yes. Well, I have to say it it has to be quite rewarding for you to have a personal relationship with him. I do know Mr. Parker and uh, I I took up learning how to mat photographs in uh, his studio. Uh, I I think I probably visited maybe five or six Tuesdays and uh, I went through all that, Chester. I went out and bought the the, uh, mat cutting tool (laughs) and then... Mm -hmm. I discovered the ease of ordering mats on the internet it requires a lot less work because cutting mats is, is really, I mean, it, it's tedious work. Uh, you know, the, the finished product, you'll save a lot of money, but you'll put a lot of, uh, you put a lot of labor into that effort. But uh, yeah, I, I definitely have a, a tremendous amount of respect for Mr. Parker and the footprint that he has left on Cleveland. I think that his story is one that really needs to be told more than once because it's because of him that artists like you and others have been able to achieve some of the success that they have. So uh, we're going to talk more about that institution as well as more about your art when we return. You're listening to Open Door with Vince Robinson on 95.9 FM WOVU. My guest is Mr. Chester Hopkins Bay. He is a multidisciplinary artist and he has work that you should have in your collection. And we'll talk about how that can happen as well when we get back. This is 95.9 FM WOVU, Burton Bell Car Community Radio. Back in a moment. Ohio is our home. And it's full of family we're proud to care for. With more than 200 locations, Cleveland Clinic is growing to bring world-class care to your community. From Canton to Avon and coming soon to Mentor. Whether it's sniffles and sneezes or something more serious, big or small, we're always near you. For every care in the world, schedule your care today at clevelandclinic.org slash access. This message was brought to you by WOVU 95.9 FM, Burton Bell Car Community Radio. Hey guys, this is Dela Shea. I'm all about togetherness. Together we make the world go round. You're listening to WOVU 95.9 FM. 
Welcome back to Open Door with Vince Robinson. I am chatting with Mr. Chester Hopkins Bay. He is a multidisciplinary artist right here in Cleveland, Ohio. And he's been working very closely with uh, one of our most treasured and prominent artists, Mr. Edward E. Parker, whose operation, and as it was just described, it's an entire block over there uh, in East Cleveland. Could you talk about some of the events that you and he have been collaborating on to share the art of artists in Cleveland with the city and the county? Well, Mr. Parker has uh, definitely provided space. I've also been working alongside Walter Allen Rodgers, who's another uh, elder artist in the art community, to kind of create a monthly event that we call the Gift of Art over at Mr. Parker's space. And it's really just a gathering of artists every month to uh, bring some work, hopefully maybe make a couple of sales, but that's not essential. But really to sit down, talk, uh, brainstorm, and you know see how we can further affect the art market up here in Cleveland and, and how we can bring art to really to, to just the common citizens of Cleveland because you know, art can be looked at as a very uh, elite uh, elite uh, area, you know, where people are tend to associated with wealth and privilege. So we look at it from uh, more of a common standpoint to where, you know, Mr. Parker has classes over at his place. Uh, Walter Allen Rogers, he goes out to the community, you know, he does face painting and, and because they're elders, they have a lot to give in, in terms of wisdom. Um, and they have a lot to offer the youth, but they just, uh, need a bigger platform, I would say, because Mr. Parker has operated out of that space for what, 40 plus years. And, you know, there's people really just now finding out about it. So the purpose of what we're doing is kind of to help spread the word about what African-American artists are doing in the community and see what we can do further in the community to, uh, to grow an audience, but also to bring an educational component to those who come in and listen and hear what we got to say. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the educational component because, you know, you've also expressed that there's this elitist aspect to the art community. And so you have some artists that are held in higher esteem than others. And I, we've probably had this conversation before, but it's just kind of ironic to me that we would have a great institution like the Cleveland Museum of Art, but we don't go to the CMA and see Cleveland artists. That just doesn't add up to me. I mean, I, I've always said that there should be some space dedicated in that building for us. And, and we should get the same rewards that artists who come here from other places get. What are your thoughts about that? Well, I'll start off by saying that Cleveland primarily traditionally has been a blue collar town. And in blue collar towns, you got to have people working and you use entertainment to kind of keep driving. And I mean, that's why sports are so big here because sports can be a, a, a getaway from just the, the mundane uh, operations of work and life. So when you look at art in a blue collar town, um, there should be space for local artists to shine at, at institutions like the Museum of Art. But when you look at how those museums operate, you know, where they get their money from, um, who they're catered to, um, they, you know, they kind of cater to the people who do have means, who do have wealth a little bit, you know. You can see it in the party that they have. I guess they're trying to loosen up now because, I mean, it's a whole lot of uh, politics involved, particularly when you're dealing with artists of color and where we stand in this city and the opportunities we've had. Uh, There have been a lot of things that came down the pipe. Like when you look at the front and how that primarily was kicked off, I guess, in the Glenville community. But for who? You know, they brought in international artists. And that's cool because they say it brings attention to the city of Cleveland on the international level. That's cool. But, you know, so does LeBron James. You know, when it comes to uh, 
a local artist, if you're bringing people in from out of out of state or out of the city or out of the country to look at these artists, that's who you bring them in to look at. You know, you can overlook local artists. You know, we can get lost in the sauce, so to speak. So there should definitely be a component to help highlight local artists because, you know, you want to keep the art tradition rich in your community. Man, if I don't have anything to aspire to, if I'm 12 years old, uh, what's to stop me from when I go to college, staying out of Cleveland, you know? I mean, I came back to Cleveland, but there was a point in time where I said, you know, I want to move. And I moved down to Charlotte for a minute because the opportunities were just uh, more profound than up here in Cleveland. So in order to, to cultivate that homegrown talent and that rich culture and the storytelling that comes along with all of that, yeah, you have to have a, a place for local artists. I guess ideally the local artists should come together and create their own space similar to what Ed Parker did. Sometimes that's what you got to do. But that just takes a lot of resources, a lot of money, and a lot of know-how. And sometimes when you just used to moving the brush across the canvas, you don't have the knowledge of how to move through the real estate market or move in the business market. So there needs to be a balance in terms of, of resources that surround artists in order to facilitate these types of things. Because we have vision, but we just might not have the means or the resources to achieve that vision. So, yeah, they should definitely find a place to highlight because that's what they represent. They represent art. You know, so why not represent the artists in your community? They used to do it a bit back then, I guess, with the May show, you know, where local artists can get in the show and, and, and get some attention. But, you know, it's a hard fight and really competitive to be out in these art shows here in the city. You know, I'm so glad you brought that up. And it just brings to mind uh, some things that have happened in the past few years I know at one time there was an effort to organize local artists, specifically black local artists. And uh, for whatever reason, it just lost its momentum and it fizzled out. And then we had the pandemic and there was a loss of connectivity. And I'm sure that, you know, being locked down or, you know, shut down for a couple of years, pushed folks back into their silos and, I'm also sure that a lot of art was created when we were put on pause. But since all that that has happened, I don't really see a major effort uh, to organize on our part. And the other thing I would say is that, yeah, it's important for institutions like the Cleveland Museum of Art to provide space for us. But I think it's even more important for us to provide space for ourselves and not depend on others to do what we can do for ourselves. What would you say to that? I would say definitely we have to uh, we can't think about the museums uh, putting us on, so to speak. And we do have to build our own institutions, really. I think we are in the days and times where. That's a, a possibility because of the arts organizations that you mentioned, you know, the ones that have fizzled out. Some have fizzled out. Some have just been kind of dormant. Um, I was part of a few of them, you know. Um, the one that we're doing over at Edward Parker, uh, we call ourselves African American Artists of Cleveland. I know there is also uh, what, the Black Local Artists of Cleveland Coomba. They're out here. And we, in order for what you talked about to happen, to, the, to create these institutions. We as a black community, and I'm gonna focus in on that, we just need to be a little bit more unified. I think our egos get in the way, uh, the lack of knowledge gets in the way. I think um, there are a lot of things that get in the way to stop us from coming together because art, the way it's set up now, is kind of like a carrot on the stick in front of the horse type of thing. I think a lot of these arts organizations uh, dangle the chance to show with them and, and the chance to be a part of what they're doing. They kind of dangle like a carrot in front of the horse to keep us moving. But part of that kind of keeps us moving away from each other because we don't necessarily need what they have at this point because we have the means and the resources within our community because 
a strong arts community is not just about having a strong community of artists. It's about having lawyers who can read through uh, contracts and things like that. It's about having people with a keen mind for business to go out and create these institutions or and show us how to do things. It's about basically, this is not just about uh, black artists in the, in the community. This is about the black community in Cleveland and how we can come together and how the arts can kind of be that vehicle which can basically change how we live up here as black people in Cleveland. Because a lot of what happens in, in our community is basically a, a, a macrocosm of what's happening in, in the arts community. You know, we are just a, a result of how we move as black people. So what needs to change is us as a, as a whole. We need to educate our youth on the importance of art, not just about making money, but the spiritual aspects that it can bring. Um, it's very tied into our culture. Uh, we also need to have it being taught. You know, people like Mr. Parker, Walter Allen Rogers, Alice Seifler, they need to be in schools talking to students, talking to kids. Their art needs to be uh, put on high. You know what I'm saying? We have a, a African-American museum up here in Cleveland that's desperately in need of help. Okay, you know, everybody in Cleveland just gave five dollars. Every black person in Cleveland, five dollars to the African American Cultural Museum. You know, we can really make some changes there, but I think a lot of times when we see uh, an institution like that and it's struggling, we tend to more look at it from a distance and say, "Man, I wish they get their act together," as opposed to saying, "Man, they need me to help get that act together," because this is about us telling our story. And what it is is that we've been, I, honestly, I think we are putting our story in the hands of people who really don't have no, a, a deep connection with us. You know, I think we're, we're giving up that role as being the gatekeepers to what's going on in our community and we're letting other people tell it. And when you let other people tell your story, they're gonna tell it their way. And I think that's what we see going on in Cleveland right now, which is why Ed Parker can remain hidden for 40 plus years and nobody knows about what's going on. And all of a sudden, when they do see him, oh, this is this is a miracle. It's like, you know, like it's like discovering King Tut's tomb. You know what I'm saying? The tomb been there for 10,000 years. You know, you're just finding it. So instead of going in and raiding those riches and taking them to the people, you know what I'm saying, and putting them up in the museums, you know, keep them there in those communities and that enriches those communities. You don't want to strip them down, you know, to black people, we need something to look forward to. We need, we got issues dealing with us from a socioeconomic level where, you know, the violence and crime and things that come along with that, lack of education, you know, um, the how we view family, all of those things are affecting us here in America and through art and culture and us enriching ourselves, yeah, that can help us get out of that, but we have to come together and, and make that happen. We just can't sit back and point fingers at each other and all of that. We got to, you know, you know when you hear something that make common sense yes. and you know, you just get aboard and say, you know what, that makes too much sense for me to deny. It. Well, I have to tell you, Chester, what you said makes a lot of sense and I really hope that folks take that message to heart. I think that two of our biggest enemies are ego and indifference and we're always waiting for somebody else to do what we should be doing for ourselves you're listening to open door with vince robinson on 95.9 fm wovu my guest is chester hopkins bay a multidisciplinary artist who has some great vision and some great insight and we're going to talk more when we return we'll be right back Yo, what up? You already know what it is. Your boy DJ Christos. Yo, I got some important information to give you. Are you a resident living in a rental property or a landlord of rental properties within the city of Cleveland? Have you heard about the lead safe prevention efforts in Cleveland? Do you have questions about lead poisoning and why prevention is important? Don't know where to start? Don't know where to get help? Well, there's good news. There's training that is perfect for you and the Lead Safe Resource Center is here to help answer all your questions. Questions. This training presents information on the Lead Safe Cleveland Coalition, the resources and teams available to support you, along with great information on who, what, when, where, and why for all things lead poison and prevention. And listen up, there's more. 
if you register now you're eligible to receive a gift card yep there's one gift card per adult attendee those interested can sign up via eventbrite or by calling the lead safe resource center at 833-601-5323 that's 833-601-5323 and ask for ashley dunn thank you for listening to WOVU 95.9 FM, a Burton Bell Car community radio station. The best thing Tri-C did for me was give me opportunities. The workforce program prepared me for the career I have now. I got a job in the aerospace industries where I work on CNC machines. I have three younger brothers. I want to teach my brothers, you know, hard work actually pays off. Come to try to see. It's a great stepping stone to wherever you're trying to get to in life. My name is Chris Grooms, and I got my start at try c Start now at try-c.edu. This message was brought to you by WOVU, 95.9 FM, a Burton Bear Car community radio station. Welcome back to Open Door with Vince Robinson. I'm having a great conversation with Mr. Chester Hopkins Bay, and he has given you a really... <laughs> poignant synopsis of the art scene here in Cleveland. Uh, I, along with you, would like to see uh, some support come to the African American Museum. And I fully agree. If everybody just gave a small donation collectively, we could have a major impact in transforming that space. It kind of mirrors uh, what's going on with the African American Cultural Gardens. And as we have this conversation, uh, an event has taken place over there and there has been some corporate support, but the folks who have supported that that effort to finish that portion of Rockefeller Park, uh, the, the the lion's share of it has uh, it has come from corporate donations. So, you know, it's just so important for us, as we, as we stated before, and I hate to de- beat a dead horse, but we have to do more for ourselves. Uh, you mentioned black local artists of Cleveland Kaumba, uh, and I just so happens that I'm working on that project. Uh, we're we're launching, we're doing a pre-launch for that, and we uh, hope to have that publication out very soon. But when we looked at doing that publication, one of the major things that motivated us was to provide exposure for artists who aren't seen. Uh, Mr. Parker is actually one of the most prominent artists that have been featured in that publication. The first one came out in 2018, and then the second one will come out in, in 2023. So um, I applaud you for the organization of artists that you are with. And I see opportunities for connectivity between what you're doing and what we're doing with Black Local Artists of Cleveland, Kaumba. Uh, with that said, I'd like to shift into a conversation about how people in the community can support artists. You know, I, I was with someone uh, at as that was vending uh, at the event at Rockefeller uh, Gardens today, and she was selling these images that were uh, matted. They they were ready to be framed, but she was selling them for fifteen. I think she said fifteen dollars and and ten dollars, and and I looked at her art, and I'm like, well, yeah, but it's worth so much more than that. But the issue was that people aren't willing to pay that much for it, and so they they don't really recognize the value of art. And and one of the the issues that we have as artists is making a living with with our craft. Uh, what do you see as the challenges of uh, supporting yourself with the work that you do as an artist? I think a long time ago I realized that um, I don't think I'm going to be able to support myself on my art. Um, I've always said, you know, if I need money, I guess I just give me a job. Um, I think art for African Americans is more so a labor of love. There are people who can live off of their art. They are that focused. They probably have a nice, a cane scene in marketing. Um, I guarantee you they're probably navigating and, and trying to move into the world where the white artists are. Um, but to make art, a living on art off of black people, it requires an educated uh, consumer base. Um, a lot of people, you know, when you live in certain communities, and your economic resources are what they are, they might be limited. You can't afford to uh, 
go and buy a, a $500 piece of artwork and sit on your wall when you're struggling to make ends. And, and yeah, that artwork could generate value later on down the line. It could be an heirloom that could be passed on to your kid. But, you know, I think the bottom line when you're looking at a person's economic situation is survival. So they're not the ones who are going to go out and buy your art. And, and sad as it is, when you look at the African-American art community, who African-American artists tend to try to market their art to, um, it's, yeah, it's, you know, it's just a hard way to go. So, yeah, you end up going down to uh, trying to get in Kane Park and places like that where they reach a, a broader audience. Um, they're, they're also more educated audience, meaning they're coming in looking for art and they're looking for art to invest in. They understand that you can invest in art and it can grow and make money for you. You know, they can they, they know how to identify certain artists who they should uh, maybe buy a few pieces from, but they also help promote those artists because by promoting those artists, they're promoting their investment. So it's a whole education around uh, making money off art that a lot of times in the African-American community, we just don't know how to do that, you know? And the minute we do learn it or some artist learns it, they're trying to move out of that uh, community. It's kind of like how we is with uh, Black Flight. When we get money, we moving out the hood, you know? So we taking that knowledge base and everything with us and we're not teaching the community around us so that community still remains broke, let's say. So, yeah, it's an educational thing. That's why I, I I don't always look to make money with my art, which also kind of, I'll be honest, I think that kind of helps keep my art true because I'm not doing it to make money, so I'm not about to compromise anything in the artwork itself. Very, very, very few artists can make uncompromised art and make a living off of it, you know, especially African-American artists, which, you know, we've gained a lot in popularity over the last few years, and that's really from what I'm reading, that's pretty much everywhere. So, yeah, that that's an interesting observation, Chester, and and I kind of relate it to uh, folks in the music genre because there are some artists who, you know, they conform to trends because they think it will sell. It's not authentically them; they're just using a cookie cutter approach to making right. a song and then they put it out there with hopes that it's going to sell a million copies, but then it just blends in with all the other stuff. And, and then on top of that, you have the whole music sharing platform. So people get their music on Spotify and Apple music and all these other platforms, and then they get paid fractions of a penny for each spin. So a record can get played 30 million times and you got $300 to show for it. Right. Yeah. You know, you can't be a six, uh, 50 year old guy here trying to make some trap music. You know what I'm saying? Trying to stay relevant. You know, you got to be true to your art and, 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 and let that speak for you. Cause you know, another, another thing that's key in the black community is authenticity. We tend to want to be, we tend to want artists who are authentic. You know, it was a turn that came out back in the day. It was Studio Gangster. So as we found out somebody really wasn't shooting people out in the street. You know what I'm saying? Oh, he's a studio gangster. His music ain't real. So we want to support that, which is authentic. So we need to be a little bit more authentic in who we are as artists and what we represent. I think a lot of times we get lost in that. Hmm. What uh, subject matter do you tend to deal with in terms of your art? Is there any specific thing that you're dedicated to uh, expressing as an artist? Um, there's a term now called Afrofuturism. And I came up with this concept called Six Cubism, which is, you know, something that is Cleveland based art for myself, like kind of like folk art, cosmic folk art. Six, cube, six cubism is kind of like this artwork that I use to this, this term that I use to describe my artwork back in 96, nine through 2000. And I didn't have a term for, I didn't have a term Afrofuturism to work for, with, but Afrofuturism is kind of like how I'll define my uh, work. 
I used to read a lot of comic books, Octavia Butler, uh, sci-fi. I was heavy into that. So all my work tends to have a a, a futuristic sci-fi uh, African cultural aspect to it. Um, my subject matter tends to be on black hope, black joy, black pain, uh, things that African-American artists and, and, and people go through. Uh, our experiences and our stories. I tend, I think my art tells uh, a bit of a story. Uh, that's what kind of, we were working on the project with The Visit where we were making these cosmic quilts. And we just have people come in and weave in uh, words to their ancestors. I would describe my work as very ancestral. Um, uh, trying to see the possibilities and what we could become or what we are. You know, superheroes play heavily into what I do. So, yeah, I would say I would, I'm more of an Afrofuturist since that's a term now. Oh, that's interesting. Is there anywhere that we can see your art right now? Right now? I have a couple murals up. Uh, one is at Notre Dame that I worked on with Cole Robinson. Another I worked on a project with Angelica Pozo that's over at the Harvey Rice Elementary School where... Uh, we did pictures of, of famous Clevelanders and famous African Americans on ceramic tile. Um, as far as being in collections right now, since I've switched to more installation art, I keep my painting a little bit more personal, and I don't show it as much. I might enter a show uh, or enter into one of these, uh, not contests, but you know, invitationals. Yeah. I might enter into one of those and they, you know, they either reject me or accept me. So I'm not really pressed about that. Um, I'm installation artist kind of where I find a lot of my passion for making art. Now I think making a canvas, I tend to um, operate on how I feel. I might not feel that like paint right now, you know, but since I don't have any commissions out, I'm not pressed to, I can just, you know, use it to speak from my heart when I'm ready to, but installation art, um, you know, see me at Ingenuity this coming uh, September. You, uh, you could have saw me at the Juneteenth Festival downtown at Mall C. Um, you can see me every Monday at Parker's. You know, I'll take some pieces down there to show and, and hopefully talk, talk with some people to come in and we can really chop it up on some art. So, yeah, I would say Ed Parker's right now is going to be your best bet. That way you can see the art and you. Okay. Well, you know, I, I'm a gallery owner, too, and I have space on my walls for anybody who wants to put their work up. So I guess or you can see me at Vince's. Yeah, yeah. this is my this is my invitation to Chester Hopkins Bay and let's get his his work up on the walls and I'll I'll take mine down and we can put yours up and and folks can take in the glory of your work. Uh, fascinating conversation, Chester. Uh, I want to shift gears uh, when we come back and talk to you about the the coming of AI and the impact that AI is having on the creation of art. I know some folks are taking the easy route and uh, punching up a few keys on a computer and generating works of art that they're selling you know, and making money with, but, you know, it's taking a person out of the creative process. There's something therapeutic. I think in your bio, you mentioned therapy in relationship to art. There's something therapeutic about creating art. And there's also something therapeutic about taking art in. So to be the observer of the art can be very beneficial to people. And I just wonder, will you get the same impact from something that's been created by a computer. We'll talk about that when we return. This is Open Door with Vince Robinson on 95.9 FM WOVU, Burton Bell Car Community Radio. Ohio is our home, and it's full of family we're proud to care for. With more than 200 locations, Cleveland Clinic is growing to bring world class care to your community. From Canton to Avon, and coming soon to Mentor. Whether it's sniffles and sneezes or something more serious, big or small, we're always near you for every care in the world. Schedule your care today at clevelandclinic.org access. 
This message was brought to you by WOVU 95.9 FM, Burton Bell Car Community Radio. Come back to go forward, back to learning new things, back to pursuing your dreams. Tri-C has flexible learning options to fit your life. And every year, more than 1,000 local companies provide Tri-C students with real-world learning. The right education can boost your lifetime earning power by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Start now with a college education you can afford. Tri-C, where futures begin. Start now at tri-c.edu. This message was brought to you by WOVU, 95.9 FM, a Burton Bear Car community radio station. Hi, this is Helen Maynard, news editor at Signal Cleveland, and you're listening to 95.9 FM WOVU, Burton Bell Car Community Radio. Hi, this is Gerard Amir Shakir, and you're listening to 95.9 FM, Our Voices United, Burton Bell Car Community Radio. We're back. Open door with Vince Robinson. My guest is Chester Hopkins Bay. And he's given us quite a bit about the scene here in Cleveland in relationship to art. He does installations. He's also a poet. He paints. He does many things as an artist. And we are definitely pleased to have him with us today. Before we took the break, uh, I was asking him about his thoughts on artificial intelligence and it being responsible for art. Uh, What do you think about using computers to, to create art? Wow. I'll put it to you like this. When back in 90, 1990, um, I was taking art class, sculpture class, and we were just getting into art on the computer and we were using, I think like Photoshop was either Photoshop 1.0 or 1.5. It was like right at the beginning of the Photoshop era, like D-Paint and all of that. I thought it was cool, but something hit me and said, man, this thing right here eventually is going to eliminate the need for artists. And I think from that point on, I just said, I'm going to focus on the human aspect of art and work on my brush skills, my pencil skills and things like that. Uh, Fast forward to now. AI art. I think it's becoming one of those tools where it's almost impossible to not use. Um, do I think that it can replace human beings? Yeah, I've always thought AI, I'm a sci-fi head. I always thought AI, once it's gained a certain amount of momentum, can replace uh, the human component. Is that a good thing? We can get into that talk all day because uh, humans create a lot of damage to this planet. Uh, look at the plastics and what we're doing with the oceans and all like that. Just since 1950, plastic coming into the to our uh, convenience, it uh, we've created islands in the ocean that are destructive to the ecosystem. Uh, there is a, what is it? one of those movies, I Robot, or one of them, where the robot, the AI, figures that the best way to save humans is to save them from themselves and that's really kind of eliminate them because of what they do to just everything else in the world. And you can see it. We violent, we kill unnecessarily. Um, we are destructive. We tear down for our needs. I mean, one use plastic, we tear down rainforests. We are, we are shifting this whole, the balance of the planet, just our presence here and our needs and wants and, and, and wants for convenience. So that's a, a tough call in terms of when you're looking at an AI created artwork. I thought that was pretty much inevitable. Now, how does that do in terms of the human response to it? Well, I'll put it to you like this. If, a human, if humans can't see it now, then they never will in terms of we can have a more sustainable way. You know, if it's going to take for us to tie back into our humanity and kind of pull away from the AI art, the AI art is is really big if you're living in a fast-paced society, I meaning I need quick turnover. Um, instead of me paying an artist thousands of dollars to design a piece, uh, let me just get on some dolly 
uh, get on some chat GPT or get on one of these AI programs and just create it myself. You know, we eliminate the need for artists really because these, a, the AI is capable of creating anything that you can prompt it to. Really, it'll give you multiple examples. You can just pick and see which one you like and it's instantaneous, the speed of it. So if we want to tie back into our humanity, excuse me, if we want to tie back into our humanity, well, we're going to have to change how we operate as a humanity. I mean, it's, it's time for us to start being a little bit more uh, conscious of our eco footprint, our carbon footprint, um, the things that we do to affect this planet. That's what's going to help us save us from AI. Other than that, you know, just roll with it until it's time to kiss ourselves goodbye. Mm-hmm. I hate to say it like that, but that's what we're doing. Yes. You know? On the other hand, you have this new digital infrastructure that is supposedly a platform for art. And we're talking about the metaverse, uh, the digital universe. And uh, then we've got NFTs, cryptocurrencies that uh, provide, uh, I guess, access to intellectual property monetization that benefits the artist. Uh, have you had any exposure to, or do you have any thoughts about the phenomenon of um, NFTs? When I first heard of him, you know, it was a people, how he made, how much money did he make off of that one? And after that, everybody just wanted to do it. It's like a, it became a hot thing. Everybody wanted to do NFTs. I didn't jump into it so early because a lot of it confused me in terms of surrounding copyright like when you uh do an nft of a piece of artwork what happens to the original uh i think i read somewhere that the nft now becomes technically the original and the original becomes like worthless almost i wouldn't say completely worthless but you know because it's on the blockchain the NFT is considered the real one, I guess. And I guess it's kind of tying into the AI thing in terms of this. You know, you can't eat a block anything on the blockchain. You know, um, it's just another way for people who are, it's just another way to devalue artists. Because if we can uh, blockchain everybody's artwork, okay, we don't need the artists anymore. Now we can take that and I own the rights to it and I can take that and make prints off of it or do what I want to do with it. And I think what it is is that a lot of these things are just done for the convenience of non-artists. You know, like I said, just get back to the old ways or whatever where if you appreciate an artist by their work, uh, NFTs and all of that. Then also I looked into the fact that NFTs, you know, in order to create these NFTs, how much uh, resources we use uh, from an energy standpoint. And once again, what we're doing is tearing the planet up, you know, because it takes a lot of um, energy to create an NFT. You know, a lot of oil resources are being used in that. It takes some uh, XYZ amount of electricity to create these NFTs and to keep these things going. So, you know, we take it with a grain of salt, but it's kind of in the same bag as the uh, AI. It's all in the same realm. You know, we just basically kind of, I don't know, yeah. pushing the artists out. Right. You know? Well, there are some who would argue that the NFT paradigm actually provides ways for artists to uh, involve others in the ownership of their work and also increase the value of their work. But I, I guess it, it also depends on the strength of the industry. And right now, cryptocurrency in America is under attack by the banking system, specifically the Federal Reserve System and their efforts to issue a central bank digital currency that will, uh, I guess, replace cryptocurrency. Because, you know, with cryptocurrency, people can act as their own bankers. But if you are dealing in the banker's world, well, they want to be able to profit from you having your money in the bank. You actually lend them money and then they make money with your money and they pay you very little. So it's another uh, paradigm of of exploitation 
but I'm I'm sure that as the weeks and the months go by, there will be some type of regulation and some clarity about it. And, and perhaps there may be ways uh, for artists to, to have more control of their art and also to uh, enjoy more of the benefit of the financial aspect of their art. Um, and perhaps it will create a situation where artists don't have to starve just because they're an artist. I, I think it's really sad that you should have to do something other than what you were created to do. If you have an ability to create as you do, you can put up a canvas and paint a picture and that, that picture can bring joy to someone and that provides the value to humanity. Uh, and it's not always about the money. It's just about the, the uh, creative process and, and the benefit that, that comes from it. So we'll have to, to see uh, as, as things uh, continue to roll out. Um, just a couple more things I, I wanted to talk to you because I remember a few months ago we had a conversation about the difference between art and craft and that, that left quite an impression on me, Chester, to be honest with you. Uh, so if you could just talk to me about the difference between art and craft. I think we kind of, um, been talking about it a little bit. I think the AI conversation it's kind of that conversation times a thousand. And and what I mean by that is this. Art is is more so based on the thought behind what it is you're creating. You know, craft is the means in which it gets done, meaning this. I know people who you can do a photorealistic painting, right? And does that make it a work of art? Or are you just a master craftsman? Uh, if I'm a photographer and um, I see a, a bird on a tree right there, and that's the most beautiful bird, and I, I want to just let me take a picture of it. You didn't put the bird there. You just captured it. You captured a moment in time. Does that make you an artist? Uh, we know you're a craftsperson because you know how to work the camera. Everybody can't work a camera with the F stops and get the right lighting and all like that. Some people, the technology has made it to where they don't have to know all of that because they got iPhones now. Um, eventually, craft people can be replaced. You know, AI is doing that. Now I can give the computer some prompts. It, it can paint me uh, a, 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 a painting in any style. And then I can take that file and transfer it over to a, 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 a laser printer or some kind of mother machine and it'll create it and turn it into a mural. You know, those are that's where craft uh, crafts is going is going to the machine. So as an artist, what is your role? Your role, role is to envision things that create these things out of essentially nothing. So it's the thought behind it that makes a person an artist, meaning I want to do this. I want to do. It's very. It's a. It's a lot of intentionality behind, it. you know. Whereas if you're just walking down the street and you just see a dog and oh, let me take a picture of that. Okay, you didn't put the dog there, you know. You didn't put him on the grass and put the ball in his mouth or whatever it is. You didn't frame all of that up. Now, if you're a photographer and you create a scene where you frame and make everything and put in that scene and then take a picture of, okay, now. We could say artistry was involved because there was a certain level of intentionality that was put into actually what he captured. So AI is kind of taking care of that conversation for me, to be honest, because like I said, it's certain it's certain groups of people in the art world now you starting to not need, you know, because a robot can do it. Yes. So I think now that, yeah, maybe that's the same way to say it, that, uh, Art versus craft is almost like man versus machine. All right. Well, I thank you for that explanation. And I think I have a bit more clarity on it. Uh, we can agree to disagree. And it doesn't mean that I disagree with you. But I really appreciate your perspective. And I also appreciate everything that you shared with us on the program today. Chester, it has been an honor and a privilege to have this conversation with you. And I'm happy to know that as a result of this interview, folks will know more about the great artist that you are. Thanks for joining me on Open Door with Vince Robinson. Thanks you have for having me, good sir. All right. And with that, to those who are listening, know yourself, 
Love yourself. Be yourself. Make today your best day. Peace.